Hey y'all, I'm James Wright and welcome to the channel. Today we are talking plain iron test. This has been a long time in the coming with a crazy amount of work put in on this. And now we can dive in to the results. So here are all the plain irons. We have 24 of them in all. Now, if you really, really want to jump to the overall results, I'm gonna send you over to the main Wood by Wright channel. There I have a very short video on just barely brushing on the, the results. This video is gonna be dedicated to all of the, the intricacies and the crazy amount of information. There were a lot of things that I learned on this and I really want to go into it detail. So if you wanna see all of that intricacy, stay tuned. This is going to be an incredibly long video, but that's because I learned a ton and I want to pass on as much of that information as I can. If you want short and sweet and just getting to which one's the best, head on over to the main channel. That's a great video for you. So with that being said, let's actually take a look at these irons and some of the specifics. Number one, we're actually going to test two old irons. These are old stock irons and I had a lot of people really asking me to do a lot more and seeing you know, the Stanley through the years and testing different ages of Stanley. The problem with old irons is before computerized testing, batch to batch, they were very different. So you can get Stanley Sweetheart and in the same year have another batch that is a wildly different steel. And yes, they may have the same alloy and they have pretty close to the same tempering and measuring, but very, very small changes can make a wild difference in the iron. So these ones are more or less controls and that's why I'm not testing a lot of the old ones. So first off, number one is the Stanley Sweetheart Happiness. Number two is a Sheffield steel iron. This is incredibly thick and uh, yeah, just well, it's, it's designed for a wooden body plane. It's laminated steel. This is old stock, good stuff. Number three, we're going to the high end. We have Lee Nielsen. Ooh, yes, Lee Nielsen. Number four, we have the Wood River. Generally considered good quality, but it's not the high end steel. It's, it's only about 23 bucks a piece. A new one on the market, DFM Toolworks. I love what he does. He's the guy who actually makes my card scrapers and so he just started releasing the DFM Toolworks irons and this is what actually kicked off the whole test because he sent me this one so yes I'm looking forward to seeing what that does. One of the cheapest ones on the list this is a Callistro. You can buy these on Amazon in a pack of I think it was like five or six of them come out to about six bucks a piece dirt cheap iron uh, we'll see what that can do. Seven Bench Dog another relatively cheap iron but uh, a lot of people swear by them. Tay Tools, uh, one of the most affordable hand planes that I actually like. This could be very interesting. Now let's jump back up to the other end of the scale, the IBC. This is one that uh, a lot of people really swear by, made in Canada, good quality stuff. IBC, um, it, it kind of has a cult following but I'm very interested to see how this one stands up. We're gonna jump on to Hawk, and I actually have both of his irons. We have the A2 Cryo and the High Carbon Steel. He offers both types, and if you ever wanted to talk about metallurgy and what actually goes into irons and chisels and making the steel right, he does an incredible amount of information on that. I love his blog posts and information on that. Another new one on the scene, the Union Plane Company. It is actually coming back. They, uh, they now are about ready to start making the Union X planes and I'm really looking forward to getting those. This is a replacement iron for the Union X plane. So it's a little bit different from all these other ones. You'll notice that it has the hole at the top um, and not as many of them do. The ones that do are the ones that are designed for wooden body planes. Um, so this one is a little bit different and probably will test a bit different than the others do. Now we can get into Veritas and I have three of their steels. We have the much coveted PMV 11 the O1 and the A2, and we're gonna be testing all three of them to see how exactly do these stand up? Are they all that good? Is there much of a difference between them? This should be very fascinating. Now this one is a little weird and the one that I kind of wasn't gonna put in here because what I'm basically testing are replacement irons. I'm trying not to replace plane irons that only come with planes, but I just had to see was the Harbor Freight 33 worth it? And this is the iron I pulled out of a Harbor Freight 33. So yeah. Um, a little bit different, but this should be very interesting. Now on to one of everybody's favorite, Clifton. This is the thickest, most beefy iron in here with the exception of the, uh, the tapered Sheffield, um, which really isn't that much thinner. This is gonna be a fun one. Uh, a lot of people absolutely swear by the Clifton. 
I wasn't going to do any Japanese irons because I'm looking for replacement standard Bailey plain irons, but there is a company that makes a laminated Japanese iron, and so this has the soft on the front and the hardened on the back, so it is a bilayer steel, and uh, this was kind of fun, but yes, we do have a Japanese plain iron in the mix. Another favorite everyone likes is the Ray Isles. This is another one that kind of has a cult following, so we'll see how that one goes. A little bit on the pricey side, but mm, sometimes you get what you pay for. Next up, we have a very new company on the list. This is Kamanish, and he actually makes them in both the O1 and the A2. These are small batch, handmade. Uh, they are, are very, very specifically made, and he does a, a really good detail. The ones, these probably feel the best. They have this perfect edge on them, and they just, uh, they, they feel very, very good in the hand. And you can also see the tempering in them. He has the, the coloring coming from one end to the other on both of them. I, these ones feel phenomenal, but feel isn't everything. How do they handle out? So yeah, we'll see how those go. Mike from Tay Tools sent me this one, which is a cryogenically treated steel. Um, and so it's supposed to be the next step up for the Tay Tools, hoping to change over from the, the cheaper one to something that's a little bit better. I'm interested to see, particularly in the cryo, there's several of these that are cryo treated. Cryo came out phenomenal in the chisel test, but how does it actually come out in the plane iron test? There's a difference between the impact of a chisel and the smooth pairing motion of a plane. That should be fun. This one was sent in by a watcher of the channel. This is the Grizzly Iron. So yes, you can actually buy Grizzly replacement irons where they come with the, the plane. Um, again, a relatively cheap iron. So we'll see how this one comes out. And then last, we have one that's very interesting. This is actually a demo model from Narex. This is actually a very early on in the process from Narex. So once they actually produce them, I'm probably gonna have to go out and test them again um, because this is a one-off. They made one iron. This is actually made for a wooden body plane, um, but it's what they want to do. And it's a very similar steel to what they have for the Narex Richter, which were the absolute best of the chisels. Uh, I wanna see what it does for plane irons. So this should be very interesting to see as well. So there you have it, 24 irons. Oh yeah, um, there were a few others I would like to add to this, but they were hard to get or I didn't have the money for it. And uh, maybe in the future I'll add a few more, but this is a lot of irons. All told, it was 34,000 shavings. <sighs> a lot of sharpenings <laughs> and a lot of time in my shop just doing this 34,000 times. So this was a lot of work, but it was well worth it because I've learned a ton of information on this. Now, if you want to actually see the detail on the actual testing method, I, I don't want to do that in this video, otherwise this video would be well over an hour long. I have entire videos dedicated to that. I have one video that is me talking through what we're going to be doing in the testing. I have another video that is the changes we made to the testing because we found out some things on it. And then I have a third video which is a live where we actually went through and watched the whole test happen. So if you want to see one iron going through one series of a full test, we have a live video that you can go back and watch and see exactly how it was done. So all that being said, I have put about a thousand to twelve hundred dollars into this test, not only buying irons, but some of the testing supplies and other things required to make this happen. Um, doing a lot of shipping. Um, I, I, one of the, the viewers on the channel was actually willing to do the, the hardness testing on it, so I was able to ship it out to him. Um, but we had several other things where we had to ship back and forth. And so this was a decent undertaking. Um, and speaking of which, if you would like to actually support this particular test, I'm actually selling a decorative jar with the actual shape from the test. So if you want to see that um, on your mantle, they are for sale and all the proceeds from this does go to help offset this. So if you'd like to help out with that, thank you. But with all that being said, let's actually dive into the spreadsheet. There's a link down below where you can go and actually look at all of the data and the numbers, but let's go do that right now. So here is the whole sheet with all the information, and this is you know, a lot. So every one of these rows is one of them. So the Stanley Sweetheart, and then we come on down here all the way down to number 24, and every row following across is all of the testing data. This red section, I'm gonna be getting to that in a little while, but first let's actually move over here and look at some of the specifics. First thing we can do is come over here and look at the source. So if you wanna go see the website where it was purchased from or information about that particular iron is there. Next we have one of the most important things. How much does this thing cost? Some of these were pre-production um, or like this one, the Harbor Freight was you have to buy it with a plane so I'm not putting the, the price in there. Um, some of them are like this, the Narex Cryo that was one off um, that you know, the, the, 
that's not for sale yet. <laughs> the, the price on it, I have no idea what that's going to be. Uh, the new Tay Tools Cryo is not released yet. So some of these we just don't have data on. Um, but most of them are standard, like the Ray Isles, $34. The, uh, the Japanese Buy Laminated, $63. Um, so some of them are really expensive. The uh, the Kamanash, um, these handmade ones, they're 75 bucks a piece. But then you can come all the way down to uh, this Callistro, which is six bucks. Um, dirt cheap. Next, we have the thickness of the plane. A lot of people are very specific about that because the thickness is, you know, the vibration. The thinner the plane, you might get more chatter from it. Um, thicker the plane is a little more stable, a little bit uh, more resounding. Um, so I measured it in inches, but then I, I hit the, the switch button on the calipers to then switch to millimeters and wrote that down. Um, then we have plane size. I wasn't able to get them all for number fours. So some of them are wooden body planes. Some of them are number threes. The Harbor Freight was a 33. So I listed which particular plane. Um, all of them were tested in one of four different planes. So I had a wooden body plane that we used for the wooden body ones. Um, the Harbor Freight 33 was tested in it. The number fours were all tested in number four plane. The number three was actually tested in a four and a quarter um, trying to get it close to the body size. So I, I, I tried to keep that as close as possible, but we couldn't always do it. The width of the iron, in other words, how thick it is. In other words, if it is for a number four, it should be just shy of two inches thick. If it's for a number three, it should be just shy of an inch and, uh, inch and uh, three quarters. Uh, and so you can, you can see exactly what they are, both in inches and millimeters. Then we have over here, this is the, the starting again of the test, strokes to 300. And I have a note up here describing what that is, but strokes to 300 is the, the dullness on this. And, and to, let me actually go up here and explain what dullness is first. So we're going to scroll all the way up here to the top, and I have this key up here, sharpness. Um, 100 is incredibly, incredibly sharp. 75 is about the theoretical at maximum sharpness for steel. It is the, that that's sharp. Um, anything 100 to 300 is is generally uh, is very very sharp. That's that's what I would consider to be smoothing plane sharp. 200 will cut hair, but will miss a few. You know, you could spend a little bit of time sharpening it. 300 is good for most working, um, but once you start getting into serious um, switching grains, 300 might be a little bit too dull. 400 will cut, and for general work, 400 is okay. I wouldn't use it for smoothing, but it will still work fairly well. Um, you're you're going to have to take it back to the fine stone at 400. The, the lower ones, you just hit them with a the strop, and they're good. 500 is, yeah, you probably should go back and sharpen it. 600 is what I might let a scrub plane get to. Um, you know, a scrub plane, I'll usually let it get pretty dull before I go back and sharpen it again. These you're going to have to take to the core stone um, and, and start back from scratch. 700 is what most people think is a sharp knife. Um, it's incredibly dull. You have to take it to the extra course to get it farther. And then 800 and plus is, you know, a fine screw, a screwdriver. So I hope this key gives you a little idea of what all these numbers mean. Um, but that being said, let's actually go back here and take a look at these numbers. So strokes to 300 is how many strokes did it actually take for the dullness to get all the way down to 300? What I'm testing here is smoothing planes. How long will this iron last as a good smoothing plane iron? So if I'm buying this iron to be in specifically in a, in a difficult grain smoothing plane, this is an incredibly important column to look at. Some of these, like the Lee Nielsen, lasted 360 strokes almost all the way through the test, and it was still a decent smoothing plane. Some of them, like the Sheffield Steel, no, 40 strokes in, and it was already too dull to be a decent smoothing plane. I would have to be sharpening that quite regularly. Um, so you can, you can go through and, and take a close look at that. Final dullness um, is how dull did the, basically the overall performance of the plane. After 400 strokes, how dull had the blade, blade gotten from its initial sharpness? So again, the bigger the number, the worse off it is. So like this one, the IBC, 452, it added to it. So that, that's, that's pretty sad. Uh, the Callistro, a relatively cheap one, 176, it didn't dull that much. So that one actually had a really good performance. Average keenness, in other words, how sharp can I get this iron to? Um, in all of the tests that I performed on it, I went through the exact same testing procedure. So I, I, I can make any of these irons sharper than what I got them to in average keenness, but this is how sharp did they actually get following the exact same procedure every time. 
And for most of these, we're yeah, pretty close to about the same. So most of them are around the, the 130 range. Some of them, the DMF tool works. Man, I could get that one sharp every time. It was just, it was pretty. Um, the the Callistro just didn't get that sharp. So yeah, if you're really worried about how sharp you can possibly get it right off the bat, this one might be important to you. Sharpenability is how much steel actually gets removed in any particular sharpening. So I sharpened them all up and then I put them edge on the stone and dragged it across the stone. And the more steel that was removed, the sharper it gets. So in this case, the higher the number, the better it is because that means it removed more steel, making it duller. So in some cases like the Callistro, um, it didn't perform that well. It wasn't as sharpenable as some of the others. But then again, the DMF Toolworks, that one actually sharpened really well. So if you're really worried about how sharpenable they are, or you're a person who uses uh, wet zones that are a little bit softer and take a little bit more time, sharpenability might be important to you. Some people really, really care about hardness, the exact hardness of it. And so we, we ran three tests of hardness on it and then averaged them out. So you can come down through this and, and see what was the average hardness of all of the irons. Then we can come over here into the durability testing. And for each of these irons, let's take the, the Wood River here. We had three full testing. So I took it through the whole system 400 strokes three times. And so every 40 strokes, I stopped and I tested the sharpness. And so we can actually go through and see what the numbers are that came out in that. And then, of course, we have a line down below where we averaged them all out. This last one here, used, that is the amount of wood that was removed in 400 strokes. So most of them are right around 2 inches of wood removed. So 400 strokes to get through 2 inches. So on average, we're doing about 5 thousandths of an inch per shaving, which is a really heavy shaving. Um, I was trying to dull them out a little quicker. I'm not taking light passes, but I'm not taking incredibly heavy passes. I figured about 5 thousandths was about average for it. So that is the way I can test that. I'm taking off about the same amount of material, is keeping track of how much material was removed and the, uh, the total of the, the test. Then next we can move over here to the edge retention. Again, this is where I sharpened it and I put it edge onto the plate and scraped the edge on the diamond plate. And so as it went on, it got duller and duller and duller. But in this case, that means that it's removing more material. So you can see by the end, most of these performed pretty similarly. Um, some of these, like the Hawk um, Cryo, this one took a bit more to sharpen. But this is if you're really worried about sharpenability, you're going to want to look at these numbers. So let's actually go over here and look at some of these charts because this is when things really start to break down. Smack in the center here, we have the durability for all. Uh, this is was very interesting. A lot of these were following pretty close to the same trajectory here. But you have this one yellow chart that comes up here, and this is the Harbor Freight Iron. Uh, it was... It almost felt like it wasn't treated at all, like it was just a mild steel. It just kept getting duller and duller and duller. It did not flatten out. It did not plateau. And so that crunches all these down and makes them hard to see. So I created another chart down here below where I just took the Harbor Freight out of it so you can get a little bit closer look at what all of these came out. And yes, they do look all spread out, but you start to wonder, um, these are actually pretty close when you compare them this way. So though you see this one is really bad in comparison to this one, they're all really relatively close. So some of the interesting things in this one, uh, Veritas PMV11 lasted the longest. It also had the, the best edge for smoothing. Um, it was really, really good performer. Uh, the, the Lee Nielsen and the Wood River were neck and neck um, until right here at the end, and the Wood River lasted just a little longer than the Lee Nielsen, but basically identical performances. The, uh, the Kimonosh A2, this one was one of the, the handmade, really nice ones. That one came out really well. The, the Narex, the, the new one coming out, that one came out really well. I'm interested to see what they have once they actually release the final product. That should be kind of fun. And then there's a whole bunch here in the middle that are all basically the, the same thing. And then there are some that just weren't quite as good. The Sheffield Steel just didn't do very well. The Bench Dog eh, didn't last as much. The, the Stanley Sweetheart, that one had a pretty steep trajectory. It didn't quite level out. It just kind of kept at that angle. The, the Union didn't last very well either. Um, then we have up here the IBC. That one was incredibly surprising. Um, and yeah, I, it did not perform well. I was expecting far more for it. I may have gotten a bad one, um, but that was... That was not pleasing. And this one up here, the, 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 the cheap Tay Tools, which is pretty much the, the, one of the cheapest ones on the market. I was kind of expecting that. So yeah, there is all of those. 
Next over here, I have some of the comparison charts. So we want to see, is there a correlation between hardness and some of these results? Because a lot of people really, really worry about hardness. So I want to see hardness and edge retention. Is there a correlation between hardness and edge retention? As you can see here, there really is not. Um, the R, R squared value is uh, 0 0.012. So there, there's no correlation between hardness and edge retention. Those two just don't, don't mean anything to each other. Hardness and keenness. How sharp can you get it? Eh, maybe a hair more, but not really much of anything. Um, down here, we can actually see sharpen sharpenability versus hardness. And in this, there is actually a pretty decent correlation. In other words, the harder it is, the more difficult it is to sharpen. The softer it is, the easier it is to sharpen. And that's, you know, that, that shouldn't be surprising because hardness is the ability to scrape off material. So you are going to see a good correlation between hardness and sharpenability. And then also with the, the sharpenability, we have a chart down here graphing out each one of them. And you can tell they're, they're all pretty similar uh, with, a, with a few. The, the Hawk A2 Cryo was one of the hardest to sharpen. Uh, then up here we've got the, the Japanese was one of the easiest to sharpen, um, which you kind of expect that. Uh, but you can kind of see somewhere in between the, the Callistro, what was this one, the Grizzly. Grizzly was actually a little harder to sharpen than some of the others. But they're all relatively close. So unless you're working with a wet stone or oil stone, um, this really isn't that big a deal. But uh, yeah, some people really worry about that. Then next, I want to come over here into this. And the Stanley Sweetheart, all of the irons were tested at 35 degrees. But I wanted to see what is the difference between 35 degrees, 30 degrees, 25 degrees, and 20 degrees. So I took the same, the same testing procedures three times through with each one and tested them at all the angles. And here you can actually see the graph um, showing all of these against each other. So the 35 degrees remained sharper longer. The 30 degrees got a little bit duller quicker and then kept about the same trajectory. The 25 degrees got sharper quicker and then kept a little bit steeper, and then the 25 degrees just got dull really quickly. I mean, this almost looks like the, the chart from the Harbor Freight. Uh, so, yeah, this, this showed me I, I'm, I'm keeping my irons at 35 degrees. Now, I, I thought about doing another string at 40 degrees, um, but at 40 degrees, you start having problems with the blade actually engaging, especially on hardwoods, it skips across. Um, so I, that it would last longer and be sharper, I'm pretty sure. But at that point, you start running into other problems. So for most cases, I'm going to be sharpening my irons at 35 degrees. If I'm thinking about doing really, really fine detail work, I'm probably still going to keep it at 35 degrees. Because in functionality, there isn't too much difference between 35 degrees and 30 degrees. And then you get down to 25 degrees, and you really see a performance drop off. And 20 degrees, and yeah, that's, that, that's not even worth looking at. So all of my irons, I'm sharpening at 35 degrees. And for some of you who like a secondary bevel, that might mean sharpening at 30 degrees and then putting a 35 second degree. You're going to get a pretty similar. Um, you're going to get the exact same. Um, results from just standard sharpening at 35. So next, let's actually come over here to this red section that I skipped right off the bat. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is taking all of these numbers and crunching them down into reality. So for all these numbers, I've broken it down into seven different things. Number one, price. The more expensive it is, the lower the number. So every one of these is ranked one to 10. Thickness. The thicker it is, the higher the number. Some people really worry about how thick it is to get less vibration and less chatter. Keenness. In other words, how sharp can I possibly get the iron? If you really want the iron that gets incredibly sharp very easily, has good sharpenability, keenness is important to you. Um, initial sharpness. So how fast does it get to that 300 mark? So if I'm, if I'm thinking about smoothing planes, initial sharpness is very important. Um, overall sharpness, this is the, the, the total durability. So how actually does this perform over the 400 strokes? The, the sharpenability is the, the last section. How easily does it sharpen? And then hardness. Some people are very worried about exactly what the hardness on it is. So all of these have been ranked 1 to 10. And then down here at the bottom, I have a section here where you can weight them all. So for me, price is relatively important. I gave it a 6. Thickness is not that important to me. Chatter, I, I really don't notice that much of a difference between Stanley and the, some of the thicker ones. Uh, keenness, I don't care how sharp I can actually get the iron. I just care how quickly it gets dull. So an initial sharpness, if I were working in a smoothing plane, this number would probably be higher. Uh, final sharpness, the overall durability of the blade, that is what is most important to me. 
Then sharpen ability, I really don't care about that. I've got diamond plates. They all sharpen pretty close to the same. Hardness, not something that I worry about at all. So I kind of put these numbers in here. If you are someone who really, really cares about hardness, you can change this to a 10. And then you'll see this graph down here change. And you can say, ooh, that, that popped some different ones up here. So in here we have the PMV 11 is the highest. Wood River is similar, but the Callistro now is really high. Um, so, you know, you can adjust this to whatever. If for you, price is the most important. You can make price 20, and we'll see what that does. Um, in this case, the, the best one, Wood River, Callistro, um, VM, PMV11 still stands up pretty well. Um, and so you can actually come through this and adjust these to what are the most important things for you. If, you know, thickness, I really want an iron that doesn't chatter. Um, I'm going to make that a 20. And we'll see how that adjusts things. And you can see here, now the most important one is Clifton, uh, Veritas PMV11, Narex, the Lee Nielsen, and Wood River. And you can see there, there are three that generally pop up. The, the PMV11, the Lee Nielsen, and the, the Wood River are ones that are, are very, very commonly in here. So if you want to actually adjust this, you can go to the link down in the video below and get access to this spreadsheet. Come up here to File. Click Make Copy because you cannot edit my spreadsheet. This is the this is the standard. You can't change this. But if you come up here to File, Make Copy, then you can make a copy and you can then edit that. So you can do this and, and do whatever you want to yours. So uh, this had a lot of very interesting numbers that came out on it. Number one, Harbor Freight, absolute trash. I, I wouldn't touch that with a with a ten foot pole. Um, the the Callistro though this. This one surprised me. For a $6 iron, that came out really, really well. Uh, PMV11, that was, you know, it's kind of supposed to be the super steel. In this case, it really came out as a super steel. Uh, some of them, like the IBC, wow. Um, I, I, I think I, I must have gotten a bad iron there or something, but that just, it did not perform on me. Now, I would like to go through this and test um, different irons from different batches so I could do three different IBCs, but this is, you know, 600 hours worth of testing. So that would, you know, every iron I add to it adds another 600 hours onto this. So this could be a full-time job for someone that lasts two or three years to get really accurate data across different um, batches because every batch that comes out is going to be slightly different. The the Sheffield Steel and the, uh, the Stanley Sweetheart. A lot of people really love old steel, but every test I've done, the old steel just doesn't stand up as well as some of the new high-tech steels that have been accurately tempered. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, I do not hold to old steel being better than new steel. It just doesn't show up in any of the tests that I've done. So, uh, yeah, you can argue about that all you want, but I've got numbers here. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, again, I could go test other ones. And one of the things about old steel is you're going to get a wildly different thing batch to batch because each one was tempered slightly different. Uh, it's just one of the natures to, to doing things by eye. You're going to get different things every time you do it. So I really do want you to dive into this spreadsheet. Take a look at the numbers. Change things up. What what things in here surprise you? What were some of the interesting things? If you can do some cross comparisons and see what things pop up, I, I would love to see that. So go into this, have a little bit of fun with it, and uh, see what comes out to you. So there is the crazy amount of data and information. I know this video has been very, very long. This whole test has been very, very long and has been... Uh, a lot of work so I, I, I was glad to show off some of the things that I have learned through this and uh, I'm, there's a lot of other things I'd like to test and, and do in this but for right now I've got to take a break for a minute so <laughs> uh, please do dive into that spreadsheet take a look through it see what you find see what information comes out to you I would love to see how these numbers affect you and what are your thought processes through it um, I was very impressed by the the Callistro that did uh, really well for a six dollar iron I was not impressed by IBC but again a lot of these numbers are really really close the difference between the best and the worst um, skipping the Harbor Freight which was trash um, all of the rest of these were surprisingly close. There were not that many that were just really, really bad. They were all very good. Uh, for me, I'm probably going to be getting the uh, PMV11 for my smoothing planes and ones I really want to put some specific into that I, you know, I use those for wild grain. And then everything else, I'm probably going to go get wood rivers and, and put wood rivers in most of my planes because it held up really, really well. 
you know, the difference between a Callistro and a Wood River in price is, eh, it's okay. Um, but the performance is a little bit better, so I'd probably go with the Wood River. But if for you, price is most important. You know, the Callistro, you get those in a pack of five or six, and they, they do really, really well. So, um, yeah, very, very surprising results. So thank you for hanging on this far in the video. Uh, I do want to say a huge thank you to all the patrons on the Patreon, everyone who's been supporting this channel. If you would like to specifically support this, you can actually buy a piece of the project and help out with deferring some of the cost. They are actually the plain shavings from the test, so if you want to see exactly what the shavings all look like and the wood, they're pretty much all identical, just thousands and thousands and thousands of shavings board feet and board feet and board feet turned into shavings. I think it ended up being, what, 12 or 13 trash bags of shavings, the, the big long size trash bags of shavings that were taken out of the shop. It was a, a fun ride all the way along. So if you'd like to own some of the shavings, you can do that now, links down below. <laughs> so again, thank you to all the patrons and Patreon, members here on the channel, everyone supporting the channel, everyone scrolling over on the side, thank you. Without you, this channel would not exist and I wouldn't be able to do videos like this. If you'd like to find out more about that, there's a link to Patreon down below or you can click the little join button and actually become a member here on the channel. So I think that'll do it for now and until next time, have a wonderful day. One of the things I found out is that some of these irons are in tuxedos and some of them are in t-shirts. And that's how you tell the difference between a sharp plane iron and a dull plane iron.